Okay, welcome everyone. We will uh, we'll continue with our topic of optimization. If you remember, in, we were previously studying what is called real analysis. Real analysis is the a careful study of real numbers okay, and real numbers and its and their associated properties. So, we studied the following topics so far. We have defined what a sequence is. We defined what a it meant for a sequence to be bounded. So, we defined a bounded sequence. We defined what it means for a sequence to converge. So, all concepts related to convergence what it means for a sequence to converge, what it means for a sequence to not converge and what it what the, the limit of a sequence is and from that we also defined what is called a subsequence. These were the four topics uh, we covered uh, so far in real analysis. Now, let me take off from here. So, it is where it is very easy to uh, see that if a sequence converges, then every subsequence of that sequence converges. Every subsequence of that sequence converges and does and and it converges to the same limit. it does so to the same limit as the original sequence. Right. Now, uh, can you tell me if the converse of this statement is true? So, if a sequence, if every subsequence of a sequence converges, then does the original sequence itself converge? Yes, no. Yes, okay. Someone saying yes. Why? Why yes? Okay, that's the correct answer. So the sequence itself is a trivial subsequence of the original sequence. So the converse is actually trivially uh, trivially true. Okay, it, uh, it, this statement is the non-trivial one. Okay. All right. Now let we were so far looking at sequences that were in living in R n. So these were uh, vector values the sequence of vectors. Now, uh, let us uh, uh, come down to sequences that are in on the real line only. Okay, so, uh, in that we have uh, we have a, a famous theorem which is called the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. Bolzano. Bolzano Weierstrass theorem simply says the following that every okay, this does not necessarily have to be in a uh, this is not necessarily true for real numbers. So, I will let me uh, this is true for vectors also. So, I will I will tell you a more general version of the same same statement. So, so the state the simply the uh, the statement is simply this that every bounded sequence in R n has a convergent subsequence. You consider sequences in R n and make uh, look at those sequence if you uh, if you and consider uh, a bounded sequence in R n and look at all its possible subsequences. 
amongst all its possible subsequences you will find at least one which is convergent, convergent to some limit. Okay. It cannot happen that all the all these subsequences uh, uh, do not converge and yet the sequence remains bounded, it is not possible. Okay. Now, the, the uh, this is actually a very deep fact essentially what it is saying is that if you constrain the sequence to be in a box. So, so if you suppose here are my axis and my sequence is, is living in this bounded box, eventually it will the very fact that you are constraining it to live in a, a, a in a bounded box would mean that you can extract some subsequence out of this such that the that subsequence eventually starts accumulating around some point. The sequence cannot dance around in, su in such a wild manner that even its subsequences are always dancing around and never will you find a single subsequence which is converted. Okay. So, this is actually a very useful fact because it, uh, it uh, may, uh, convergence of Algorithms are, uh, are make make extensive use of this particular fact, proof convergence proofs of algorithms. I'll just give you an uh, give you a general sense about this. See, when we are computing something in optimization, what we are effectively generating is a sequence of points, sequence of iterates. Sequence you have iterate at time one, then another you go through another loop, get to the next iterate, then you get to the next iterate, then you get to the next iterate, etc. So what you get are these. Are these iter is, is this iteration x of 1, x of 2, x of x of 3, etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. And what we want is eventually that this sequence, if you look at the limit of this sequence x of n, this this limit should converge to the solution of your problem. Solution of the problem under consideration. Right. So, for example, if you are looking at this, if you want to, if you are, since we are talking of optimization problems, you want to, this to converge to the solution of your optimization problem. Now, to show uh, one of the big challenges that occurs in analysis of algorithms is making sure that this this actually happens. And we may often the steps towards arguing that go through the argue, go through. You need first a, a way of arguing that the sequence converges at all to begin with, and that comes from Bolzano White Star theorem. You argue that there is at least a subsequence that converges and from there you build your argument. This is a, you use a, a common way of arguing. Okay. All right. So, this is Bolzano White Star theorem. Okay. Now, uh, now let me come to uh, sequ uh, sequences or sets in, in, in the reals. Okay. So, now let us look at just the real line and look at suppose some set of points on the real line. Okay. So, for instance, look at the set which is the let me I will just write this uh, in, in words the set of positive rational numbers for instance. So, this is the set of all numbers m by n, n not equal to 0, m and n. So, m comma n both positive and they are natural numbers. Okay. So, if you look at if you look at this set, this is a set of all positive rational numbers. Okay. Now, we define we say that a number L is said to be a lower bound.
L is said to be a lower bound if if it is less than equal to all elements of S. So, now if you take S to be the set of positive rational numbers, what can you give me an example of a lower bound? minus 1, 0, these are all lower bounds. Right? Likewise, a number u in R is said to be an upper bound on S, the opposite is true. If x is less than equal to u for all x in S. Now, again for the same example set of all positive rational numbers, can you give me an example of an upper bound? There, there is no upper bound, ok. Now, what we will, so if a set is bounded, If a set which is a subset of R is bounded, then does it have an upper bound or and a lower bound? By definition, right. So, it does have an upper and lower bound. Why what did we say? What did we mean by a set is bounded? We said we look at the norm of the of the elements in that set and all elements should have a norm less than or equal to a prescribed number. So, what it means in this case we are talking of a set of real numbers. So, the norm is just the absolute value of the number. So, the absolute value of every real number, every number in that set is bit is between minus m to plus m, where m is some uh, m is some positive number, right. So, if the absolute value is between minus m to plus m, then it means what does this mean? So, it so mod x is less than equal to m. This means that x is less than equal to m and greater than equal to minus m. What does what does this mean? For all x in s, for all x in s. What this means is that m is an upper bound and minus m is a lower bound. So, a set if it is bounded will have an upper bound as well as a lower bound. Now, upper and lower bounds are not unique. If you have if m is an upper bound, then m plus 1 is also an upper bound. Okay. Likewise, if L is a lower bound, then L minus 1 is also a lower bound. You can keep making lower bounds smaller and smaller, they will continue to be lower bounds. You can make upper bounds larger and larger, they become continue to be upper bounds. So, here is the another concept which is called the least upper bound. least upper bound is the smallest such upper bound um, amongst all upper bounds. Okay. What does this mean? That if I take a num if I take a number even slightly smaller than this least upper bound, then it cannot be an upper bound. Okay. This let me write this in English first the least of all upper bounds.
what does this mean? If I for all epsilon greater than 0, okay, there exists an, an x in S such that x is greater than sorry, so I should just write this better. M is said to be the least upper bound on a set S set of R if for all epsilon greater than 0 there exists an X in S such that x is greater than x is greater than m minus epsilon. So, m is said to be the least upper bound on a set in a, uh, S sub which is a subset of real numbers. If for every epsilon greater than 0, you can find an x such that x is greater than m minus epsilon. So, you cannot make m even slightly smaller and still have it as a lower as an upper bound because there will be at least one element whose value will be greater than m minus epsilon for every epsilon. Okay. Likewise, L is said to be the greatest lower bound on S if for all epsilon greater than 0 there exists an X in the set such that So, if I increase L even slightly, then I can find an element that violates my condition. Is this fine? Okay. Now, there is a chicken and egg problem that arises in trying to define what this, uh, trying to uh, trying to show that such a thing exists. The very fact that to show, if you want to show that uh, the a set must have a least upper bound, then what you want to what you need is that the set of upper bounds must have a lower bound. Likewise, if you want to show that this a set must have a greatest lower bound, then it means that the set of lower bounds must have an upper bound, a smallest such upper bound, right. So, that so the this is worked around using what is called the completeness axiom. Completeness axiom simply says that uh, the uh, every bounded set of real numbers has a least upper bound. and a greatest lower bound. So, if your set is bounded, then it does have a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound. If your set is just bounded on one side, means it is bounded above, okay, then it has a greatest, uh, it has a least upper bound, but may not have a, uh, a um, uh, but, uh, does, um, but does not have a greatest lower bound. 
if it is bounded below, then it has a greatest lower bound, but does, uh, does not have a least upper bound. But if it is bounded, it has both least upper bound and greatest lower bound. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, so this leads us to the definition. So, now, so once you have with the axiom, you know that such a thing exists. So, the greatest lower bound has a name. Instead of calling it the greatest lower bound on S, we simply we simply say the supremum of S, and it's written as this. Oh, sorry, my mistake there. We simply say the infimum of S. Okay. Any least upper bound. is called the supremum. 